All right. Good evening, everybody. I hope every I thank you all for coming in during the storm. My name is Paul O'Neill, uh, and on behalf of Kingston's Buried Treasures, I'd like to welcome you all here to the third installment of our series. And tonight's subject is Alton Brooks Parker, which is it's perfect timing, right as we come into the presidential election. It's good to see that you know politics can also be gentle and nice, and, and Alton Parker seems to have been very well respected and considered to be uh, uh, a man of integrity, although as Hugh Reynolds had reminded me, not everybody uh, believes that. You can't please everybody in, in politics, and even our daily Freeman, I think, cut into him a little bit. But by and large, he seems to have been a, a well-respected uh, and a, a genuinely decent man, which leads us to our presenter tonight, who is also a, a very decent and wonderful man. John Waddlin is our presenter tonight, and I have had the pleasure of working with John over the past 15 years. John is, uh, grew up in Highland, and he is one of our local attorneys here. In fact, he's a, uh, a partner at Rusk, Waddle and Hepner Marticello right down the road. He is a past president of the Ulster County Bar Association, and he really is the preeminent authority on Alton Parker. So without further ado, I will hand this off to uh, John Waddlin. Thank you, Paul, and good evening. Alton Brooks Parker. People don't know much about him, but it's time they do, because he was a remarkable person. In the 1930s, a book came out they also ran. It was a book about all the major candidates that had run for President of the United States and lost. Many forgotten. They say about Alton Parker, he's the most forgotten of all the forgotten men. And that's not right, because he was really an outstanding person. Another book came out, and it's up through the year 2000. It's about all the presidential candidates and vice presidential candidates that ran and lost. This was compiled by Leslie Southwick, who is now a federal judge. And he sent me a complimentary, a copy of his book. And I want to read just a little bit about what he says about Parker. Judge Alton Parker has the distinction of being the only nominee for president whose life has been deemed so colorless, so lacking in dramatic detail, that no book has been published about him. <laughs> Someday, I may change that. I've been thinking about it for quite some time. Jack St. John, a local attorney, had been a scholar uh, concerning Alton Parker, and he wanted to write a book about him and was working on it. But he didn't complete it, but as I'll tell you a little bit later, uh, he did some things and wrote one article about Parker. And one day I was over at Jack's office and uh, I asked him what he was doing. He says, writing this book, and I didn't know much about Parker at the time, but I know quite a bit now. And after Jack passed, his family was kind enough to give to me all of the research he had done. So I have a lot of things to work, work from. So I'll start at the beginning. And you should be on, do you want this one or do you want this one? This is fine. Yeah. Okay. Just hit that. Okay. Alton Parker was born in Cortland, New York, in 1852 on a farm. The farm did not have, his family did not have a lot of money, and his goal of going to Cornell uh, was not possible, so he had to get a job, and at age 16, he was a teacher. And he then went on to Binghamton, where he taught school, he was probably 17 or 18, and Ed Ford was kind enough to tell me about an article in the Freeman published just after uh, Parker's 
death in 1926 uh, about a story of uh, an experience Parker had teaching in Binghamton. There was this bully who was a bit of a problem and uh, he was probably the same age as Parker and he was told to stay after school but he, he didn't, he just left. And the next day he came back and the rumor was that uh, he had a pistol. So Parker walked down the aisle where this student was and according to this article grabbed the student, threw him on the floor, beat the heck out of him and sent him home. This student begged to come back to school a few days later and thereafter was an outstanding student. <laughs> so thank you, Ed, for bringing that to my attention. There was an advertisement for a principal of a school in Accord. And uh, Parker applied for that and got the position. So he's 19 years old. He moves to Ulster County and uh, is the principal and a teacher in the Rondout Valley area. He moves in with the Schoolmaker family, which was quite fortuitous for him because they had a daughter, and I'll tell you in a few, in a few minutes that uh, he married that daughter a, f uh, a few years later. So in addition to teaching school, he uh, also wanted to learn more about the law, and he came up here to Kingston and started to read the law, as most people did who wanted to be lawyers, in the firm of Schoolmaker and Hardenberg, different schoolmaker from the family he was living with. Uh, so he got a taste there, but he was able to go to Albany Law School. And at that time, law school was one year, and in fact, most lawyers uh, read the law in uh, law firms and didn't actually uh, go to law school, but he did. He went the one year, uh, graduated, passed the bar, got married, that was 1873, and um, started to practice here in Kingston. He took a position, in addition to working in a law firm, as clerk of the Board of Supervisors. Of course, Ulster County up until the 1960s was run um, by a Board of Supervisors. So he got to know everyone throughout the county and he was well known. He campaigned for Judge Schoomaker, uh, a Democrat throughout Ulster County and worked for his election. There was an opening in the position of surrogate of Ulster County in 1977 and, or 1877, yes. And uh, Parker ran for that position, was elected, and at age 25, he was the Ulster County surrogate judge, a part-time position. Uh, since he was filling out a term, he had to run again, and the next year, uh, the Republicans did not put up any opposition to him. He was well liked and he was reelected as surrogate. In 1880, he attended his first Democratic National Convention. So even though he was a part-time judge, politics was in his, in his blood he liked the idea of working for candidates. And then in 1984, Grover Cleveland was elected President of the United States. And you may recall, you know, Cleveland was the only president that was elected, lost, and then got elected again. But from, 19, from 1860, Abraham Lincoln, until 1912, Woodrow Wilson, there was only one Democratic President of the United States. That was Grover Cleveland. And after Cleveland was elected, he offered Alton D. Parker a very prestigious position, that of Assistant Postmaster General. But Parker declined. He did not want to go to Washington. He preferred staying in Ulster County, being a judge, being 
a lawyer. Parker also worked for the election of Governor David Hill, a Democrat in New York State. Now I'm going to depart briefly from his career as an attorney, judge, and politician, tell you a little bit about what he did for rest and relaxation with his friends. At that time, in the mid-1880s, uh, the state legislature was creating the forever wild lands of the Adirondacks and the Catskills. Parker and his well-connected Democratic friends were aware of this. In fact, it resulted eventually in the Constitution being uh, amended in 1894, uh, ensuring that these mountainous lands will be forever wild. But at that time, New York, uh, as New York was looking for land, Ulster County had a great deal of land because the uh, tanning industry of cutting down all the hemlocks and using it for tanning, that was coming to an end. And all that worthless land up in the mountains, nobody wanted it. They didn't pay taxes on it. Ulster County became the owner of large tracts of uh, what many people thought worthless mountainous land. And Ulster County was indebted to the state at that time considerably. And a deal was made. Ulster County is going to transfer this land over to New York State. New York State cancels Ulster County's debt. Well, Parker and his friends knew about this, and they also knew how popular it was in the mountains to visit the Catskill Mountain House, the Grand Hotel up in High Mount, places like that. But they wanted to have their own little private resort. So Parker personally took title to 1,400 acres high up in the Catskills, uh, a spot that is the headwaters of the Esopus River and also the headwaters of the Neversink, the Esopus draining to the Hudson, the Neversink draining to the Delaware. So in anticipation of the club owning this, Parker took title to the property. They built a lodge up there in the mountains where Parker and his seven well-connected Democratic friends would have a club for their, themselves and their family. And they built a lodge up there. That's the Winnesook Lodge of Big Indian New York and from probably around 1890. And if you were to go there today, it looks just the same. And it looks out over a lake. And that's the headwaters of the Esopus. And the first president up there was Alton B. Parker, where he would go with his friends in the uh, summertime. It's much cooler up there. And I can tell you that in 2006 and 2007, uh, I was the president of the Winnesota Club. So you can see the connection I have and my interest in uh, Alton B. Parker. We'll now go back to Kingston and there's an opening in the Supreme Court locally. Governor Hill, who Parker had worked for, uh, had the opportunity to appoint someone to the local Supreme Court and he appointed Alton Parker. So now we have Parker full-time as a Supreme Court judge. He moves with his family. Uh, I'm not sure where from. I'll have to do that, do some more research. But he moves to this building. Seen that one? One Pearl Street. Uh, and that was the home of Parker for uh, oh, about 10 uh, years. I'll tell you where he moved later. And presently that's the uh, chambers of Appellate Division Judge Kavanaugh.
in uh, doing my research on Parker, I went to the county clerk's office, tried to look at all of the deeds, all the different properties that he had owned. And when you look at the deeds, you typically see that the property is located in a town or a city and also Ulster County. Normally deeds aren't accepted unless it starts out that it's in the town of Hurley, county of Ulster, something like that. And I came across one deed and it didn't have that. It was kind of odd. So I figured I would read through the entire thing. Well, it was a deed to his pew in a church. <laughs> he actually purchased and had recorded in the county clerk's office a deed to pew number 71 in the Reformed Protestant Dutch Church. There um, was an election uh, following his appointment to the Supreme Court the following year. And again, in this uh, Republican county, the Republicans put up no one against Parker, and he was elected to a term of the Supreme Court. At that time, there was no appellate division of the Supreme Court leading up to the Court of Appeals, but they did have a fairly heavy workload. It was increasing. It was uh, that time in our state, in our country, where uh, things were really prospering. So they created a second division of the Court of Appeals. The actual appellate division came along in 1896. Parker, with his reputation in 1889, was appointed to that second division of the Court of Appeals to handle intermediate appeals. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about a story that Jack St. John wrote. He was interested, of course, with uh, Ulster Savings Bank. Jack St. John was president of the Ulster Savings Bank for many years, and he did some research. In fact, wrote a, uh, an article that was published in Ulster Magazine, 1995. Seems uh, you know, Parker was a director of the Ulster Savings Bank. So he wasn't prohibited from doing that by being a member of the Supreme Court. Or, well, certain irregularities were discovered. And in fact, the word got out and Ulster Savings was in trouble and they were worried about a run on the bank. They needed quite a bit of money just in case. So Parker and I believe General Sharp, I could be wrong on that. If anybody knows about that, they can tell me later. But uh, Parker and another director took a boat down to uh, New York City. They had the connections there. And they came back with suitcases filled with cash just to handle any kind of Ulster savings uh, run that might occur. They came back, they opened the doors, the people were lined up outside Ulster Savings, and Parker says, if you wish, you may come and get your money, but it would be wise if you let it stay. Well, they were worried. They said, you know, how can we count on it? And Parker got up on the counter and he says, I pledge my word, and that was good enough for these people. He had that kind of reputation, that he pledged his word and prevented a run on the bank. Had he known the extent of the defalcations and embezzlements that had gone on, he probably never would have said that. But he did prevent it at that time, and the officers involved went off for a long time uh, to prison. Now we move into the conventions that begin to lead up to Parker's eventual run for President of the United States. So who's going to be in charge of the Democratic Party? In 1896, the convention was held in Chicago, and a very young congressman, William Jennings Bryan, only 36 at the time, uh, 
was nominated, he got his forces together, and he was representing the interests of the Midwest, kind of the uh, frontier of our country at that time. And most of the farmers out there and other businessmen were in debt or in need to borrow money, and they wanted easy money. And that was the big issue at that time, gold standard and silver. And Bryan at the 1896 convention gave his famous speech. And I'll quote just a small portion. Having behind us the producing masses of this nation, we will answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. One of the most famous speeches in the history of our country. And he uh, obtained the nomination, but he knew that without the support of the most important state, New York State, and the Democratic uh, leadership of New York State, you wouldn't have much of a chance. I mean, New York was the biggest state in electoral votes, very, very crucial, important state. So Brian had to leave uh, the convention in Chicago. He traveled by train to Rhinecliff. I learned last week when I gave this presentation that he actually took a few days of rest in Red Hook from the Red Hook historian. I was not aware of that. But he knew that he had to see the leaders of the Democratic Party. So, thanks. He realized he had to travel up to Winnesook, because that's where the leaders were. The chairman of the state Democratic Party and his friends, which of course included Alton B. Parker, who, not active, uh, as an officer or anything like that, but no doubt he would have been there. So Brian crossed the Hudson River, no doubt by ferry or boat, got on the train that goes up the Esopus Valley to Big Indian, took a horse and buggy, takes quite a while to go eight miles up the mountain to visit the folks at Winnesook with the hopes of getting the endorsement of the state Democratic Party. And he gave a great speech that night because he was a fabulous orator, one of the most famous orators. But the next morning uh, he left and he did not have the endorsement of New York's Democratic Party. Um, the amount of influence Alton B. Parker had on that, I'm not sure. But the forces and the people that were behind William Jennings Bryan uh, were not the same as those who will eventually support Parker. 1897, a big year for Alton Brooks Parker. He gets the nomination. And of course, at that time, we elected our judges to the Court of Appeals. That was true up until the early 1970s. Parker runs for chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals and wins. And by doing so, he became the only Democrat in the decade of the 1890s to win a statewide election. So you can see that his popularity might lead to another nomination in the future. He proved he could be elected. Having been elected to the Court of Appeals, his uh, friends from the Winnesook Club gave him a dinner in 1897 down at the Waldorf Astoria, and that's a program from that event. Now I'll tell you a little bit about maybe the f most famous case that uh, Parker decided 
at the Court of Appeals. And that's the case of Abigail Robeson. I don't know if anybody remembers it from law school. I don't, but uh, now I know about it. She was a pretty lady from Rochester, New York. And in fact, she was described as attractive, strong-minded, sensitive, intelligent, tenacious, intrepid, pucky, but shy. <laughs> so her, her boyfriend had taken some pictures of her. And to her amazement, one day when shopping, she saw all of these bags of flour with her likeness, with her portrait on them. And she had never given permission that her likeness could be used. She thought that was wrong. She wanted to stop it. She wanted an injunction. She wanted some compensation for this invasion. So she sued and she prevailed. But the flour company, having invested in an awful lot of uh, bags of flour, and with deep pockets decided to appeal. And we had an appellate division at that time. And uh, she, the uh, company appealed, but Abigail won again. But they weren't through. They went to the Court of Appeals. They argued the cases there. And the vote of the seven-member Court of Appeals was three to three. It comes down to the chief judge, Alton B. Parker. And he votes against her. No right of privacy in New York State. Because that did not exist in the law. And he felt uh, that he was not, uh, the court should not be an activist court in creating a law that, and a right that had not existed. But he urged in his opinion that the legislature promptly consider this and adopt a right of privacy. And the legislature did that quickly thereafter, uh, putting the uh, rights of privacy in the, in the civil rights law. So it showed the kind of um, judge he was. He did not feel that the court was there to create new rights that had never before existed. Now, being uh, such a successful judge, he felt it's time to move out of Kingston and move to a larger mansion on the Hudson River. He moved down to a sopus to a place called Rosemont. And this home uh, sits looking at the Hudson River, in fact, looking right at Esopus Island. So he moves to this new home. And in the same year, 1898, um, his daughter uh, is married. And she marries Reverend Charles Hall. He's an Episcopalian minister here in Kingston. At that time, in my research of deeds, I see that pew that I'd mentioned before. Well, Parker sold it because he switched churches. And the, and the consideration indicates that he had actually paid $545 uh, for the pew originally and sold it for 400 So he took a loss on it. But when you think of that amount of money, $545, I mean, that would be several months pay for a, a working person. A remarkable sum. Uh, I mentioned his daughter, um, who uh, married Reverend Hall. Uh, he had two children. He had a son, uh, John who died at age seven. And uh, Parker never spoke about him again from my readings. But uh, he did have a daughter and then grandchildren. Back to the political scene, year 1900, another time for conventions. Um, as you know, McKinley had won in 1896, defeating William Jennings Bryan. Bryan went back to the Democratic Convention and got the 
uh, endorsement again so that he could run again against McKinley. Anybody know who William Jennings Bryan selected as a vice presidential candidate in 1900? One of the many forgotten people, but you're going to recognize this name. His running mate was Edway Stevenson. So that would have been the grandfather of the Adway Stevenson most of us remember as having run against Eisenhower twice. Parker really wasn't involved. He was very content being uh, a chief judge of the Court of Appeals, wonderful position. So he wasn't involved in the 1900 uh, presidential race, but William Jennings Bryan has gone down to defeat twice now. Parker continued to add to his Esopus estate. In fact, he uh, was able to sell his residence on Pearl Street in 1902, and he continued to buy lands in Esopus, and deed research indicates that in 1905, 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, he kept buying more land, adding it to his extensive farm. He was known as quite a, quite a farmer, fruit and and uh, livestock. That was probably the time that he also acquired a library. So to the north of Parker's residence on the Hudson is this building, which is quite nice. He used it as his library. Here is another shot of it uh, from the west looking at the library, the building, and the Hudson River uh, behind it. The current residence provided those two uh, photos to me. The huge library table that he used was donated by a later owner of this property, Walt Seaman, to the town of Lloyd. And if you appear in the town of Lloyd Justice Court, you will see that huge table there and has a nice plaque that it was Judge Walton B. Parker's library table. Now we finally get to the big year, 1904. Uh, this particular uh, photo is from a popular magazine at the time called Puck. And there's Teddy Roosevelt and Alton Parker shaking hands, uh, ready for a, a boxing match. So who was going to lead the Democratic Party in 1904? Well, the leading contender was William Randolph Hearst, owner of the newspapers. And he thought he was in a position to garner the nomination and take on the very, very popular Teddy Roosevelt, who had become president upon the assassination of McKinley. Um, Roosevelt was president for three and a, more than three and a half years, I, I believe. So it's off to the Democratic Convention in St. Louis that year. And they gave speeches. In fact, conventions uh, up until well, 19... 60s or 70s, probably maybe even a little later, um, there weren't that many primaries. It was the delegates from the various states that would get together and they would vote and they would give speeches and they would decide who the nominees are. Now the primaries have it all decided and the conventions really uh, just, um, just are for show. So at the convention, New York uh, delegates uh, had decided to back Parker, and they garnered quite a bit of support around the country. And you needed two-thirds vote to get the nomination. And after arguing all night long, giving speeches and so on, they voted at 5.45 a.m. for their nominee. And Parker came up just nine votes shy out of a thousand 
to have the required two-thirds vote for the nomination. That was so close, it was obvious that he was going to get it on any future vote. So delegates changed their mind uh, that hadn't voted for him, and they gave Alton B. Parker a first ballot victory for the Democratic nomination. The platform they adopted said nothing about the one big issue that had divided William Jennings Bryan and Parker. Gold, silver, the gold standard. They just kept quiet, maybe with the idea that if we didn't say anything, uh, it won't give anybody a reason not to vote for us. So anyway, but that was still a big issue. So Parker is informed that he has now received the nomination. He's living down in a SOPUS. At that time, the uh, nominees typically did not attend the convention. And his comment uh, on the platform was no comment. Well, that wasn't very good. Uh, the press were really pushing him. So they're demanding, you know, where do you stand on, on the issue of the gold standard? Well, what Parker did every morning, and he was going to do it that morning, he gets up, he goes down to the Hudson River, he jumps in, and he takes a swim. He would do that every, every day, uh, at least in the summer. And then when he's through swimming, he uh, saddles up his horse, and he rides for an hour or so on the back roads of Esopus. That was his routine. <coughs> Convention's still going on. And they're wondering, how does he stand on the gold standard? What's going on? And someone started to circulate a false telegram from Parker, trying to undermine his nomination. This false telegram indicated, or tried to say, that um, his, his position was, the gold standard is established by law, and I cannot accept the nomination unless that plank is contained in the platform. It's as though he's dictating to the convention You've got to take my position on this. Well, that's not the kind of person he was. And that was shown to be a false telegram, not his. His shining moment, Parker's shining moment in the campaign, followed shortly thereafter. When he heard about that, he went down to the telegraph office and he sent off uh, his position. And that was... I regard the gold standard as firmly and irrevocably established and shall act accordingly if the action of the convention shall be ratified by the people. As the platform is silent on the subject, my views should be, should be made known to the convention. And if it is proved to be unsatisfactory to the majority, I request you to decline the nomination for me at once so that another may be nominated before adjournment. He was considered a real hero for this. He had the nomination, but he was ready to decline the nomination if they didn't like his position and his understanding of the gold standard. So they thought quite highly of him that he was willing to take that kind of risk. So it remained. So what does he do now that he has the nomination. Uh, here's another um, magazine cover. It says down here that he's a farmer, uh, a jurist, and a presidential hopeful. He continues to work. He's still chief judge of the Court of Appeals. There's work to be done. They had to get out opinions. So in throughout July of 1904, he worked at the Court of Appeals, and they finally released 26 opinions that they had been working on. Only then, in the first week of August, he resigned from the court. And having resigned, he was then free to accept the nomination and get started, hopefully, towards the um, election process and take on his opponent 
Teddy Roosevelt. Parker was really the last of the Gilded Age um, politicians or candidates. The trend was towards the progressives. I think that Teddy Roosevelt could be considered um, one of the early progressives from his party, followed by progressives like Wilson from the Democratic Party. And it was a time of change. Uh, the Eastern establishment probably wanted to go with our man Parker to try and keep the old Gilded Age alive. But it was kind of the end of that era. The Democrats selected um, Davis from West Virginia to be the vice presidential candidate. Well, you would hope if Parker was not going to run hard, he would at least send his vice presidential candidate out there to uh, campaign hard around the country. Unfortunately, Davis was 81 years old. And, you know, th th that was a little bit older in 1904 than it is today. And he pretty much stayed in West Virginia that he represented and didn't do too much else. So it was a campaign without really big issues. And Roosevelt was very, very popular at the time. Uh, he picked Fairbanks as his VP candidate uh, and sent him out west to the new states that we had uh, in this country to uh, campaign. Not too much happened. Finally, Parker said, well, maybe I better get down to New York and uh, see how the campaign's going, get myself around a little bit. He goes down to campaign headquarters, and some of the campaign workers didn't know who he was. They didn't recognize him. So you can see the kind of trouble he was in. Uh, as it got closer to the election, they did bring up uh, an issue with Roosevelt's campaign, uh, the manager going to the trusts, which were so prevalent at that time. They were breaking up some trusts, not all trusts. The trusts were just big conglomerates of different industries. And the word was that uh, the campaign manager for, for Roosevelt was shaking down these trusts, saying, hey, we want some money for our campaign. And uh, could Parker show that and maybe uh, uh, turn the direction of this election? So he gives some speeches in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, but it's right on the eve of the election. So he makes these allegations about the possible corruption of Roosevelt's campaign. And Roosevelt responds by, prove it. Well, uh, you didn't have TV to get on and respond in a matter of hours or even a day. It took time in those days. And there simply wasn't time. The election was right there. So Roosevelt kind of uh, blunted that attack very easily. So it comes time for the actual election. And Teddy Roosevelt, um, he lived down in Oyster Bay on Long Island. He voted down there. And Parker voted right here in Kingston. Uh, kind of unusual. I don't know how many times it, it's uh, happened that both uh, presidential uh, uh, candidates were from the same state. It certainly uh, was a disadvantage for Parker, had he run against someone from another state, he might have been able to, to carry New York. So what would you do if you were running for President of the United States? You cast your vote. Would you go out to lunch with all your supporters and your friends, or would you spend your time with your family? Well, you know what Parker did? He went to the dentist. <laughs> That was kind of the, as they described him, you know, somewhat of a gray, colorless man. <laughs> well, the votes came in, 
and it was not good for our man uh, Parker. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had 56 percent of the vote and Parker only 38 percent. There were several other uh, minor party candidates including the socialist uh, Eugene Debs who got close to a million votes. Uh, Parker only getting five million votes. So it wasn't too close. The, the Democrat Parker still carried all of the South. The South in those days essentially had one, one party and the Democrats would carry that automatically. But uh, he did not do well. And I consider that point in time to be the, the passing of the old Gilded Age into the progressive period. Well, Parker then has, what do I have next here? Not moving. He was relatively obscure before the election, wasn't known nationally, New York State at best, and he went back to being obscure. Thank you. Here's a button from the campaign. Uh, I'm wearing a button also that has both um, Parker and Davis, the vice presidential candidate. Parker went into private law practice in New York City. And you can bet, having been uh, chief judge of the Court of Appeals for seven years and having been an appellate division uh, judge and Supreme Court judge and surrogate judge, certainly he was going to have uh, some great clients. And in fact, he, d he, uh, he did write a lot of labor decisions and he ended up uh, doing a lot of labor law work at that time. He did attend the Democratic National Conventions in 1908 and 1912. The one place he, of course, would really like to have been would have been the United States Supreme Court. But he would have needed a uh, Democrat in the White House, and they would have to think a little bit more like him, and Woodrow Wilson in 1912 was uh, really from a different faction of the party, so wasn't much hope of an appointment of Parker to the Supreme Court. Parker did follow up by being president of the American Bar Association and president of the New York Bar Association and I believe the city of New York as well. He continued to live in a SOPUS. I, I think we're doing okay here. No, no we're not. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, I can do the slides this way. Okay, we'll go back one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I collected Topps baseball cards as a kid. I was not aware that they came out with Topps trading cards for presidential races. But when I saw this on eBay, I had to have it. So I uh, purchased it. Um, it's in, you know, perfect perfect shape. How much did it cost? Uh, wasn't much. You know, six or seven dollars, I'm not sure. Here's Parker on horseback towards the uh, end of his career. He liked to ride the uh, back roads of Esopus. 1917, his uh, wife that he Married in 1873, uh, Mary, she passed away. Parker at that time was 65. When he was 70, he uh, got remarried. And um, at that time, he gifted the large home, Rosemont, to his only child, his daughter, Bertha Parker Hall, and the library building, which is 
to the north of that, he uh, gave to his second wife, uh, Amelia Campbell. He continued to practice law in New York City. The firm was called Parker, Marshall, and Auchincloss. An interesting thing about the deeds to his daughter for Rosemont and to his uh, second wife for the library parcel was that they didn't get recorded until after he died. So the title searchers in the audience would uh, you know, probably raise an objection about that, but it seems to have gone through okay. When I wanted to do some research over in the surrogate's court, uh, I asked for the file, and in their usual uh, very uh, helpful manner and efficiency, they had the original file there the next day that I was able to go through, including his last will and testament and estate. And in March of 1926 is when he signed his last will and testament, and it was only uh, two months later, May of 1926, Parker was uh, traveling from his New York City office back to Esopus. In fact, he was in uh, Central Park, and that is when he passed away. And he's buried here in Kingston in the Wiltwick Cemetery. When I uh, went there, and I asked uh, the folks, I said, do you know where uh, Judge Parker's grave is? Or Maybe I asked for Alton Parker, and they said, oh, he was a senator? I said, no, no, it shows you how well known their most famous person in Wiltwick Cemetery is. But I found it, and this is uh, his grave in Wiltwick Cemetery. Uh, this shows his wife, Mary Louise Parker, and his young son, John Parker, who he never talked about, who passed away at age seven. And the most impressive Part. You may not be able to read it that well, but uh, this is the other side of it. It indicates he's born in Cortland, New York. Well, incidentally, there's a uh, elementary school in Cortland called the Alton B. Parker Elementary School. He was Justice of the Supreme Court on the Second Division, Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, Democratic Presidential Nominee in 1904, President of the American Bar Association, President New York County Lawyers Association, President State Bar Association, and passed away May 10, 1926. I'm only sorry that it doesn't say that he was president of the Winnesota Club as well. <laughs> so that's the uh, life of Walton B. Parker, our local Ulster County Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals, presidential candidate, somebody who should be well known. And I thank you very much. Are there, are there any questions for John from anyone in the audience? Judge, judge Work, our current Ulster County Surrogate Court judge. Yeah, I just want to know if the whole family still, uh, what happened to Bertha Hall's descendants? Are they still in Ulster County? They're not. Um, Ted Oxholm, um, who I think is a great grandson, uh, joined with me in uh, 2004, the, the 100 year anniversary, when the Kleinosopus Museum had some functions concerning Parker. And we had uh, students from the uh, Parker School in Cortland come down and give a skit. Uh, Ted Oxholm was pretty elderly at that time. Um, and, he, and he wasn't from our area. I believe he has, I believe there are some descendants uh, out west, and the Kleinus Opus Museum has some information on that. Okay, and would that have been the mother of Ted Oxholm or wife? Uh, no, wife. Wife, okay. Ted Oxholm came from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, he married into it but not local. Yes? Uh, there is um, uh, a 
kind of a long stretch relative that lives down in Florida that actually did come up on the focus and um, wound up coming down to see me. And uh, I met him and his wife. They lived, uh, I kept in touch with them for a while. And then I don't know, they moved. But uh, uh, if you look at that man and you thought about a cookie cutter, it was a cookie cutter that looked just like Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I know that uh, Alex Contini, the, the president of the Klein Asopus, um, has some information on current relatives, so I, I do intend to get in touch with him. Yes? Um, was it Parker unusual for a presidential candidate at that time, and, and never leaving his home, wasn't he campaigning on his tour? That's right. He pretty much stayed on his porch, uh, didn't run an active campaign. Um, what they expected of him, I'm, I'm not sure, you know. We'll have to, you know, maybe get some proceedings from that convention uh, to find out why uh, he didn't get out on the trail. In all fairness to all Parker, it was a very nice porch. <laughs> very nice porch. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he could run from the White House, so he had uh, his platform at that time. Yes, the bully pulpit, as he called it. Yes, yeah, yeah. But not as nice. I keep hearing about, in connection with Alton Parker, is Danbury Potter's case. Yeah, um, I'm afraid not. Uh, I do want to try to read a lot of his opinions so I could get more of his philosophy and uh, you know put a chapter in the book about that. Do you, you? Have to write a book I, I would like to, um, since he's the only major party presidential candidate who's never had a book written about him. So it's, it's certainly an, an opportunity. What yes. happened to his library? Um, all the books and so on. I really don't know. He, he did in his will uh, leave his personal memorabilia to the people of Kingston. And there was no place to accept it. So there was no place that has that. Uh, I guess it just stayed there uh, with his family. Uh, the Library of Congress has certain correspondence that was left with them. I've been in touch with the Library of Congress. They say if I come down there, they'll dig it out and I can photograph it. I, I yeah. know that uh, there's a Parker Dining Hall in Newcombs, uh, Newcombs has, has a dining hall in the same uh, but I don't know if it's Sunni. You know, they pick historical names from the area, but I don't know any other connection. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, the, the New Paltz Normal School goes back to the same time. My grandmother graduated from it in 1891 or two. Hey, John, as far as the city of New York and when they took the land to the reservoir, the show camp, Parker involved in any of that? Uh, uh, that you're uh, about? Uh, I, I have not, and I kind of doubt it because he would have been back to New York City on other types of cases. So I don't think he was involved um, either for the city uh, or defending anybody from the eminent domain cases of that time. His uh, prominent practice in New York was he a rich man or guy? Uh, Yes, he, he, he was quite wealthy, and he had a you know, considerable amount of land. But, uh, he, yeah, he was well-to-do. Yes? Well, Martin Van Buren from uh, uh, Kinderhook, yeah. Uh, that was earlier, yeah. And, 
know, those who ran and lost in Dutchess County, we have Tom Dewey, who uh, lived over in the Millbrook or Pauling area. Okay, thank you. John, thank you, thank you very much. And we're, we're very privileged to have John here because as you can see, Owen Parker has been somewhat forgotten. And John is probably one of the most preeminent uh, historians on Alton Parker. And it's not fair. It really is not fair that we have a presidential candidate that lived right down the road and nobody really knows about him. And I have to say, I'm just as guilty. I ask during the jury orientations, I ask the jurors, I do a little history on the courthouse, and I ask them, I ask if anybody's heard of Alton Parker, and, and I think I've had two people raise their hand out of the thousands who have come through, and I say that's a shame, because if I asked this 100 years ago, everybody here would know Alton Parker. Everybody in the United States would have known Alton Parker, and probably everybody in Europe. So with John's help and with your help, uh, hopefully we can bring back Alton Parker and let people understand what in it, how important he was. Uh, and we would encourage you to write that book. It's not fair that he doesn't have one. Um, and there, there's another book called They Also Ran that does have a statement and it says that the 1904 presidential election is one of the only elections in our country's history where the voters were, were privileged to have two first-rate candidates for president. Um, so that says a lot. It says a lot about Walton Parker, and it says a lot about, about us. So um, we thank you, John. We thank everybody here. And John, if you get a chance, his pin is very interesting. I, I asked him if he may, it would be a nice gesture if he handed out a pin, a campaign, a, a Parker campaign pin to everybody. And he said, I, I think, what, what are you, crazy? <laughs> so we won't have that, but it, it is interesting. And it is, uh, it's great that we have him here. And that's what this series is about. It's about bringing people. Kingston and Ulster County have had some unbelievable figures here. And a lot of them are forgotten. And what we're trying to do here is to bring some of them to the forefront. And Walton Parker really is and should be one of Ulster County's favorite sons. So we hope he does get the credit he deserves. It does, and we do do tours, and I had the Highland Elementary School, fifth graders there today, and honestly, they were very interested in Alton Parker because of the presidential campaign that's going on now. So we're trying, little by little, and I, I would uh, let everybody know that I, I, we have some upcoming uh, presentations in, on November 16th of this year. We have our next presentation, which will be Sojourner Truth, which will be given by Ann Gordon, who is our Ulster County historian and is seated in the second row. Uh, Sojourner Truth really became an international figure one block over at, our, at the Ulster County Courthouse, which is now known as the Sojourner Truth Courthouse. So Anne is, is one of the most knowledgeable people about Sojourner Truth, so I encourage you to come back here November 16th at 5.30. Uh, and on December 14th, we have a presentation by Stuart Murray on Thomas Cornell, who is really known as the Vanderbilt of the Roundout. So I encourage you to come. We thank you. We want to thank the Senate House, who remains open for us here so that we can have this. Uh, we'd like to thank Bob Rizzo, who is filming this. And it will be played on Kingston Public Access uh, Channel 23. So you've all seen it. If you want to see it again, by all means, turn it on. If you want to get a copy of that, you can uh, talk to Bob. He can get that for you. I want to thank Joe Tantillo, who put together all of this the PowerPoint presentations. And I also want to thank the Kingston Buried Treasure Group because they uh, and myself was included in there. What we really want to do is bring back the history of our area. We live in a very unique place, a place unlike almost any other place in this country. And we take a lot of it for granted. Uh, so what we're trying to do is once a month present one of these people. And it's not easy. You know, finding people who are knowledgeable, and uh, we've been very fortunate that people like John Wild and Ted Dietz did the first presentation. These people have spent years researching these individuals. It's not easy. And we benefit from that in an hour by learning what took them years. So it's very important what they're doing. We encourage you to continue to come to these events. It's ordinarily the third Friday of every month at 530. Uh, 
a couple of the weeks due to holidays, we may move it to the second. But we encourage you to come. And again, I would like to recognize some of the people from Kingston's Buried Treasure. We have Tom Hafe, who's our, uh, one of our local aldermen. Ed Ford, who is a, the City of Kingston historian. We have Ann Gordon, who's an Ulster County historian. We have Joe Tantillo, who has done, again, all the design work here. Uh, Pat Murphy, I don't believe, is here from uh, Friends of Historic Kingston. Uh, Nina Posupak, who is our Ulster County clerk. So again, if you see them and you have any ideas of other individuals that you'd like to see featured, please let us know. We would love to do it. Uh, and again, I thank you for coming here. I thank John Waterland for doing this. We hope to see you back again. And if there's anything, if you have any suggestions, please let us know. Okay? Thank you, everyone. Thank you.